Well, next key verse in Romans 6.20 that we should learn well. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. Think of that. These aren't just words. These are concepts. Your existence before you became a believer is hopeless. Nobody that was on the side of God's righteousness was trying to steer you into a lifestyle that's got more godly than the one you were leading. Even the human good that you're doing, even if you're a moral believer, a moral unbeliever. Believers were formerly slaves to sin and free from the control of righteousness, implying a new control by God of the individual when he becomes a believer. That's the verse 20. Now let's just take a look at the verses leading up to this. This is leading up to things, so you put the stuff that came before it in your mind. Let's see what we're doing here. Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we still live in it? All that memory work I did years ago. I wish I had a good memory. I could memorize lots of verses and have them on recall, but I just don't have that talent. Constant work. What shall we say then? Are we to be continuing in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized, who have been once for all time baptized into Christ Jesus, those believers, have been baptized into his death? What he accomplished on the cross for us is an actuality now that you believe in it. We've been buried with him through baptism into death. Four, we become united with him in the likeness of his death and the likeness of his resurrection as well, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in the order that the body of sin might be done away with. So it goes on and on. The death he died, he died to one to sin once for all. In the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Keep on going, reading through it. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. You have the capacity to control your life before God so that you don't want to obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of righteousness, but present yourself as God to those as those alive from the dead and those, your members as instruments of righteousness of God. You know, all those functionalities of the human body and mind, you can push towards honoring God with faithfulness. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Paul had taught them. Now we have the Bible. We have even more than the Paul gave the Romans. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of the flesh, flesh but just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to the righteousness, resulting in sanctification. There we go. Verse 20. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Okay. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. Paul once again emphasizes the believer's position before he became a believer. <clears throat> now that you're wondrously in part of the family of God, let's make a big transition in what you do day by day before God in this temporal life, before it goes away too quickly. He was a slave to sin. Paul once again emphasized the believer's position. He was a slave to sin, sin nature within him, and thus free from the control of righteousness. The sin nature dictated his actions all the time such that he was constantly sinful. Even the human good that he did was motivated out of the sin nature and not out of a motivation of God's righteousness. It's a whole new thing, like learning how to ride a bicycle. For at no time is the unsaved individual under the control of God's righteousness. Even though you're thinking you're doing good, I'm a good person, and so on now. No, you're not under God's control of righteousness. It's your own definition of your own, of your own righteousness, which is evil. But when an individual becomes a believer, verse 620, Romans 620 implies a new control by God of that individual is set in place, a control of righteousness, the details of which are not immediately provided, but will be in later passages. Just go to Scripture. Romans 6.21, what benefit did you reap at that time before you became a believer from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. Paul exhorts believers to stay away from offering the parts of their bodies to sin. 
What benefit did you reap at that time when, from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. Why go to self-destruction deliberately? Paul poses a rhetorical question to motivate the believer away from sin and toward righteousness. His question stipulates that the Roman believers were now ashamed of the former lifestyle which was enslaved to sin. Furthermore, Paul declares that those things which characterize the lifestyle under the slavery of the sin nature result in death, separation from God via early physical death, even eternal death if one dies in slavery to sin, having never believed in Christ as Savior. Why carry the, the uh, standard of going to death? Car carry the standard of going to eternal life. Thank God for the grace of God. You can do that by simple confession and moving on, studying Scripture, following the leading of the Holy Spirit, and awaiting circumstances for you to show off the knowledge that you have, the willingness to obey it by sharing your faith with somebody, and so on. Hence, Paul presents to believers the end result of slavery to sin, early physical death. He does this for the purpose of exhorting believers in view of the fact that they are no longer slaves to sin, the sin nature, to now, now offer the parts of their bodies in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. Verse 22 of Romans chapter 6. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life, which is guaranteed. The result of the believer being freed from the control of sin is to become a slave to God under the sovereign rule of righteousness. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him and so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, read these, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Does it sound like we have a choice? Absolutely. And when you make the right choice, guess what you get at the end of the road? Eternal resurrection body with all kinds of rewards are waiting for you in heaven. Unbelievable pile. Just like when you were a little kid, Christmas tree, all this stuff is for me. Wow. This is eternal, too. These aren't just momentary gifts until you grow up and need another bicycle. For sin shall not be your master, because you're not under law, but you're under grace. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. So just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery and impurity into ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. And in verse 22, and now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life. Paul describes the believer's condition of having died to sin. The verb is in the aorist tense. A one-time completed action for all time at the point he became a believer having been set free from the absolute control of the sin nature. This is hard to get a handle on. You've got that sin nature in you, but you don't have to let it control you. Look around. Define things in terms of your eternal destiny. Completed action for all time. Sin nature, absolute control, gone. Once again in verse 22, but now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves to God, this, this, thus Paul states, that the result of believers being free, set free from sin is to become slaves to God. That's a great thing. He's not going to do you any wrong. He's going to give you nothing but blessing. To his righteousness, which benefit one reaps is holiness, and which results in eternal life. Notice that the phrase, have become slaves to God, in verse 622, is parallel, and thus equated with the second half of 618, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. In other words, slaves to the rule of godly righteousness, in the believer's life. You want a direction? Have the creator of the universe, your creator, direct you. The verbs in have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness are both aorist participles which define a completed action once for all time at the set time one becomes a believer. Hence, a positional truth is in view and an ongoing action is ruled out. You don't have to keep on doing this to make sure you have your salvation. Notice that being under God's sovereign rule of godly righteousness is in the believer's life does not exclude the capacity of that believer to offer the parts of his body to sin as instruments of wickedness from moment to moment for which he will be held accountable. The latter Paul commands the believer not to choose to do but he is commanded to make the choice to live righteously every day. Believers being set free from the control of the sin nature uh, and becoming slaves to God reaps the benefit of directing them toward righteousness which leads to holiness. Why holiness? 
Well, the benefit individuals reap as a result of becoming a believer is that of being set free from slavery and to absolute control of one's intrinsic nature and becoming slaves to, instead to God and his sovereign righteous rule, being directed perfectly towards your own personal enjoyment of eternity. Being a slave to God is being under the direction of the sovereign control of God's righteousness. God's righteous control of the believer moves the believer in the direction of righteousness, which leads those believers, that believer, those believers, who co cooperate with God's leading to holiness, godly behavior in the believer's experience, nevertheless the believer has a choice to make. That's why to offer the bodies, parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, rather offer yourselves to God is the command. The result of the believer having been set free from sin and enslaved to the righteous rule of God is a benefit to the believer in every way, which leads to holiness and which leads results in eternal life. You may not do a perfect job, none of us can claim that we will, but we get transformed to a perfect resurrection body by the grace of God simply because you weren't faithful. Yeah, you weren't faithful all that well, but you believed. At the moment of faith, it's a completed action. Eris tense. The moment one becomes a believer, one is set free from slavery to sin and is slaved instead to the sovereign righteous rule of God. Such a be position benefits the believer in such a way that it can lead to holiness in the believer's temporal life as he cooperates. The more holiness movement, uh, moments you have in this life, guess what you're rewarded for? Eternal rewards. Certainly will lead to holiness in the eternal life that he owns forever. Notice the position of the believer under the enslavement of the sovereign righteous rule of God, which was permanently established at the moment one became a believer, results in eternal life, but it is not a product of a faithful lifestyle, exclusively a result of one's being positioned under God, under the righteous enslavement of God by the grace of God. So don't have any worries about it. I haven't been faithful enough. You're going to get a marvelous eternal destiny. Make it even more marvelous. Since there is no condition presented here in order to maintain the believer's benefit of eternal life, then it is evidently eternally secure. You don't have to do anything to maintain it. God has it secured for you. He seated you in heaven, Ephesians chapter 2, 6. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Believers are motivated to offer the parts of their bodies to holiness in view of the fact that they have the gift of God of eternal life and have been set free from enslavement to their sin natures, which leads to eternal death. But you don't have that. It might lead to early physical death if you turn your back on all these bonus benefits for you to be faithful. Believers are motivated to offer the parts of the bodies to holiness in view of the fact that they have been set free from sin, set free from enslavement to their sin natures, and have been become slaves to God. The result of this change in positions is stipulated as follows, and the result is eternal life. All of this is corroborated by the fact that the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, which we incorporated at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone. The wages of sin is loss of fellowship with God, physical and eternal death, but since God's grace through a moment of faith alone in Christ Jesus Christ alone covers those sins, the believer is secure in his eternal life, but because it is the gift received, free without strings attached. Death is in view here in opposition to eternal life, hence death in this verse, verse translates primarily to eternal death, eternal separation from God in the lake of fire, which we have shut the door on. For God so loved the world that he gave his one only son, that whosoever believes in this shall never perish. The door is shut on perishing eternally but I have everlasting life. The wages of sin is loss of fellowship with God in his temporal life for the believer, physical and eternal death, though, if you're not a believer. But since God's grace through Christ Jesus covers those sins of the believer, that only the believer, then this does not, not, this is not to say that the believer who sins will earn the wages of eternal death in the lake of fire. On the other hand, sin in the believer's daily experience leads to loss of fellowship with God and can and often does lead to early physical death. But these kinds of death are not in view in 6.23 of Romans because the kind of death here is just juxtaposed to eternal life in 6.23b. Recall 5.20-21, to which has believers in view when it says, Where sin increased God's grace to cover those sins, the believer increased all the more, so that grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the believer is secure in his eternal life, even if he sins, his sins increased because where sin abounded, even in the believer, God's grace abounded much more so that grace might reign in the believer's life through righteousness to eternal life for sure because it is through Christ Jesus our Lord, not through our efforts. So eternal life is permanently secured because it is through Jesus Christ our Lord and it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life is not therefore maintained, lost, or verified as a result of the believer's own actions even when they fall short 
of the glory of God. 